Hello and welcome to an excellent Nautical Institute uh, webinar on the subject of seamanship. My name is David Petreco and I'm with the Nautical Institute headquarters staff and uh, I'm actually here in headquarters so that's that's a nice change. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the Nautical Institute but just in case we have any newcomers the Nautical Institute is an international professional body and we have members all over the world and branches which we will tell you about. Our main role is to help our members with professional development, uh, continuous professional development, lifelong learning, whatever you like to call it. We also represent our members in industry forum, uh, such as uh, at the IMO where we have an NGO status and other organizations. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of sharing of information. And in fact, that's exactly what we're doing here today. We share information in written form and verbal form. And we share information to try to establish good practices. And the reason we do that is we believe that together as maritime professionals, the more we know, the better we can make decisions. And that's what it's about, making better decisions, which leads nicely into what we're talking about today, which is seamanship and the essential decisions that we need to make with seamanship. I'll just reiterate that we are a membership organization. And if you are, for some reason, not already a member, please do consider joining um, as soon as possible. Right, so this is an interactive webinar. Your microphones and your cameras will not work, but you can write in the questions. and You can fill in a little question box there don't forget to press the send button and we will try to get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A. Uh, there are also a couple download documents uh, that you can uh, see in your control panel, so feel free to download those at any time during the presentation. After the webinar is finished, there will be a little pop-up survey. It only takes a minute or two, just a few questions that will help us um, improve our offerings uh, in the future. There is also going to be a certificate of attendance or a CPD certificate, uh, and that will come with a thank you email sent about two hours after the webinar is finished. So you're more than welcome to that. This uh, is being recorded, and the recording will be posted on our public YouTube channel. Uh, and on the Nautical Institute's members only page. So please uh, allow probably to about Friday for that to be posted, and then you can review it and share it with all your colleagues. You're not alone. There are about 550 people now um, registered. And so when you do write your questions in, please be as succinct as possible so that we can get through as many questions and comments as possible. It is now my pleasure to hand over the proceedings of this event to our CEO, Captain John Lloyd. John, you have the call. Uh, David, thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, to all of our audience around the world for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Lloyd, Chief Executive of the Nautical Institute. And, and it's fantastic to be back uh, with one of our webinars, uh, the first that we've held uh, in, of this nature uh, since June of this year. Uh, and my thanks also to the, the panelists who've uh, put their time into preparing for today and look forward to your questions. Um, so we're going to have the, the, the structure we've got for today is that we will uh, we'll have three uh, short presentations um, and then we will move into a question and answer session. Um, uh, so thank you and welcome to you all. Um, when it comes time for, for your session, please introduce yourselves. And, and John, John Johnson Allen, uh, your first cab off the rank. We look forward to you uh, telling us about yourself and, and your thoughts on seamanship. Is it an essential skill or a dying art? John, over to you. Thank you, John. I thought you were going to tell me, tell everybody about me, but never mind. I'm happy to do it. Um, I spent nine years on BP tankers, then I came ashore. Um, I spent 22 years doing RYA um, shore-based courses. Um, I spent two years at Lowestoft College teaching seamanship to ex-Iranian commandos, trying to teach them technical English and seamanship, which was an education. Um, I have now become a maritime historian. I've written five books and I give a lot of talks on various maritime matters. So here we go. Well, of course, seamanship is an essential requirement. 
Um, in his foreword to the last edition of the Admiralty Manual of Seamanship, Adm Admiral Sir Trevor Saw, who's the Commander in Chief Fleet, wrote, Royal and Merchant Navy captains and commanding officers alike depend on the quality of their seamen to ensure that seamanship evolutions are conducted in a safe and professional manner. The attributes needed to achieve these evolutions professionally and without incident include knowledge, competence, attention to detail and experience. I would define seamanship. Let me just add another little quote in, if I may. In a foreword to the present edition, Vice Admiral Burns, who is now the present fleet commander, he says, we must never slacken seamanship standards, nor in ignore the hard lessons of living and working at sea learned over hundreds of years of experience. Now, I would define seamanship as a skill of conducting a vessel from the smallest size. There actually, I'm sitting in the stern of that little boat on Barton Broad. Uh, to the largest size, thank you, there we are, a large bulk carrier waiting to go into Saldana Bay in South Africa, from one place to another by any means of propulsion. So seamanship isn't restricted to any size or type of vessel. No specific examinations are required, although there are some specific qualifications, because after all, seamanship is a practical skill. The examinations of the Royal Yachting Associations at various levels, including competent crew, yacht master, coastal and ocean yacht master, are designed for recreational sailors. For professional seafarers, the basic efficient deckhand qualification covers basic seamanship, rope work and wire work, the use of lifting equipment and the rigging of stages and bosun's chairs. The EDH certificate requires an applicant to hold a preliminary cost qualification, such as RYA, RYA Yacht Master, which puts it in its position, really, doesn't it? Or a fishing class two certificate of competency and a minimum of six months sea time in a vessel of more than 15 meters. <clears throat> so looking at our qualifications necessary, well, Dame Ellen MacArthur learned to sail as a young girl on a lake in Derbyshire. She did her RYA exams and then in, in her early 20s raced single-handed around the world. Robin Knox Johnson also sailed single-handed around the world, slightly more slowly than she did, but he was an apprentice and navigating officer in the Merchant Navy and holds a Master Mariner certificate. Some of the essential requirements for seamanship include a comprehensive knowledge of the international regulations for the prevention of collision at sea, and practical skills such as work, 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 steering, stability, and ship handling. And just to put in, in case everybody thinks I'm going on too much about small boats, in the last edition of the Admiralty Manual of Seamanship, 166 pages are devoted solely to boats and boat handling. This is a skill which some people find hard to comprehend. As I said, I spent two years at Lowestoft College teaching practical seamanship to former Iranian soldiers. They weren't natural seamen, but Iran is not a maritime nation. It ha has only a relatively short coastline. Other maritime nation nations make more successful seamen, for example, Norway and the islands of the South Pacific. But is it a dying art? Could AI be taking over? There are possible or even probable applications in the navigation and conduct of a medium to large ship, as with autonomous ships. Machine learning in the maritime industry uses the analysis of data collected from marine operations to improve routing, predict, predict maintenance, and enhance safety. But the nature of the sea, as we all know, can be unexpected and unpredictable, and the sound <coughs> knowledge of seamanship is, in my contention, more useful in dealing with the unexpected and unpredictable. Looking at smaller craft, seamanship is essential for the operations of vessels in the fishing industry, for example, when hauling and shooting nets. Further operation where seamanship is also essential is in the maintenance of ship marks and surveys, for example, in the operation of Trinity House. The days of boy jumping, and I had to make correct me on this, are long past but the use of small boats is still an essential element of their operations, as I saw when on board the Patricia. 
Lastly, while recreational sailing is still enjoyed by thousands, the art of seamanship will st still continue to be essential. Finally, the satisfaction of using the art of seamanship in a successful application of the necessary skills in any situation that may occur <clears throat> is a significant reward to any seaman, although to many it is a natural way of life. Thank you. John, thank you very much for those insights and uh, bringing a, a sort of multinational perspective with it, with your own experience too, to the question about um, seamanship and its application and the importance of understanding it from from the grassroots level through through small boats um, and sometimes blending it with qualifications but sometimes leading leading with experience so thank you i'm sure we'll have some questions for you a little bit later on john but thank you for those insights um so i'm delighted to um to uh, bring along our next speaker uh, commander adam Keane uh, from trinity house um adam would you like to introduce yourself and, and share your thoughts please thank you mm. Yeah, OK. Well, thanks very much. My name's Adam. I work at Trinity House as a commander and uh, I've got some some words to you today. Thank you to John for some of those um, images and so forth that uh, might have some parallels with what I say. And uh, I hope you find my input interesting and engaging. And please enjoy the slides that I've put together to give some context as to what I'm saying. Uh, when I first read the title question and was invited to participate in this discussion, I knew immediately that my answer to the first half of this question would be that seamanship absolutely is an essential skill. I think it's the key foundation of running a ship and operating it safely, and I think it always will be. The second element as to whether it's a dying art, I think is a little more complex, and I would argue that rather than it being a dying art, I think it's a, more of an evolving art, as it has been over decades and centuries prior to today. The word seamanship can evoke different images and definitions from all corners of the maritime community and from various roles on board a ship. And although those words would be slightly different, I'm sure all the definitions would be equally valid and equally interesting, as we'll see here today in this discussion. I don't think it's going to be possible to explore all the avenues today, but I hope over the next few slides to dip into a few areas from my perspective <coughs> at sea currently. So what is seamanship? What does it mean to me? Well. Seamanship is the exercising of knowledge necessary to navigate, maintain, and operate a vessel safely. I'd be lying if I said they were my own words. They are taken from Graham Danton's seamanship book, which I eagerly purchased some time ago when I first started out as a cadet. And I find that that definition sits rather comfortably with me, and I shall endeavor to explain why. Those words were written some time ago, but I think the principles still translate and stand true today. 21st century seamanship is in some ways very different from the traditional view, and yet it's still required at every level on a modern vessel, and in my experience, it's critical to running the ship in a safe and orderly manner. In terms of seamanship at Trinity House, I think it's very much alive and kicking, and uh, John has already uh, set me up for this section. I've been sailing in the capacity of master on Trinity House vessels for almost two years now, and I've worked here for approaching a decade. Um, as a general lighthouse authority, we're responsible for maintaining aids to navigation. We're engaged in offshore operations such as buoy work, boat work, towing, surveying, emergency duties, and a lot of coastal navigation. And all these tasks require the team on board to work together and use their seamanship skills collaboratively. At Trinity House, we place seamanship as one of the key components of running our vessels and, we, and trying to carry out our operations in the safest possible manner. To that end, we've a dedicated seamanship manual on board our ships, which is a, one of six key ISM manuals that we use. This seamanship manual, it's a controlled document and it formalizes experience, procedures, and advice on a wide array of topics. Launching and recovering a boat, general boat handling, local knowledge for lighthouse landings and coastal areas all feature heavily. It also gives advice to masters on locations for anchoring, operating, and berthing, and like all good ISM documentation, it's subject to regular review. All users of this manual are encouraged to submit updates and amendments whenever an opportunity for improvement is seen. Uh, carrying out buoy work is one of the most critical operations that our vessels conduct. And as master, I'm always looking for the whole team to be well briefed and prepared as we're going to rely on each other's skills and experiences throughout. Note in the images you can see on the screen where you can and you can't see people standing in the different phases of the operation. That's seamanship in action. The team's working together and they're keeping well away from the danger areas when the 
uh, operations in a particular phase. Prior to starting this task, the master will assess the weather conditions, the tidal window, and the best way to approach the buoy. Without delving too deeply into DP, dynamic positioning, we always look to set up in a safe position, and should anything go wrong, the vessel will then drift away from the target and away from any dangers nearby. However, naturally, maintaining aids to navigation takes us a lot closer to the many dangers that most mariners are trying to avoid. Thinking about what may happen if it goes wrong is also an example of seamanship skills in use. And once we commit to lifting a buoy and it's hooked into the crane, the ship is technically and temporarily anchored to the seabed through the head of the crane. And it's therefore vital that the buoy is lifted in smartly and disconnected as quickly as we can. In this example, seamanship is absolutely an essential skill. And phrases such as never stand in a bite are as valid as ever during this work. In order to remain current, I think seamanship skills have to evolve and change over time. And this can be seen in several areas on board our vessels. It's already been mentioned today, um, but buoy jumping. In previous years, the operation to lift a buoy out the water involves somebody jumping or stepping smartly onto the buoy to hook in the crane. This picture on the left there might evoke excitement in some and horror in others. With the introduction of DP providing a more stable work platform and the availability of new tools, this process no longer happens. The vessel is positioned alongside the buoy and a simple tool, which is known locally as a happy hooker, you can see in the right hand image, it's used to pass a line and then a strop through the lifting eyes of the buoy, all done remotely from the relative safety of the vessel's deck. Some may lament the loss of seamanship skills and no doubt in the past there were some excellent examples of jumping onto a buoy and carrying out that task in a seaman-like manner. But as the task changes, so seamanship changes around it. Where one skill fades, the requirement for another develops. And a simple example is using this new tool. That becomes a skill in itself. It requires familiarity. And when it's done correctly, it takes but a few seconds. And if it's done incorrectly, it can take several frustrating attempts. But once people learn how to do it, it becomes another skill in your seamanship toolbox. Working with boats and ships <laughs> launches is another large component of our workload. And these take a great deal of planning and preparation to ensure that they run smoothly. Everyone's part in the operation is equally important, and we once again rely on our team skills and experience. This is built up through regular training and opportunities for exposure. We always aim to launch the boats in the best conditions possible, and we use the ship to create a lee from any wind, sea, or swell. This minimizes the risk to the boat's crew and makes the operation as safe as possible. Once away from the vessel, the team in the boat must work together to achieve the task at hand, which they can only do if they're well trained, briefed and have a base level of knowledge to apply that any situation that might arise. Skills develop with time and changing technology. And whilst I say this currently as the captain of a ship with open lifeboats, the principle of ship launching, uh, sorry, safe launching and recovery of boats remain the same. We try and give the best lead possible. We always use a painter and these basic skills are always discussed before we start the operation. If we're talking about the launch and recovery of a 40 year old wooden Trinity House motorboat into a gravity davit, or if we're talking about the launch and recovery of a modern P28 jet boat into a single point auto tension davit, the basic principles and the seamanship skills required are still as relevant and important as ever. Sharing skills and problem solving is another element that I think seamanship skills are critical for. And we can share skills from other seafarers, other vessels and other industries. We can be open to new ideas and look at things in a new way. Some ideas work and some ideas don't. We're always keen to investigate an opportunity for improvement. And if it stands to make the operation safer, smoother or less labor intensive, perhaps even quicker, then we can all potentially benefit. When coming up against an issue, this leads us to fall back on our basic seamanship skills at all levels and look out for each other. We have to be open to suggestions and then formulate a plan. As you can see in these images here, chains, anchors, sinkers, they all have a habit of fouling themselves from time to time. And we look over the side of the ship and we're faced with a new problem. No two problems are ever the same. And some of the most satisfying days on board the ship can be when a challenging situation arises and the team works together to solve it. In these types of situations, professional seamanship in every sense of the word is absolutely an essential skill. So to conclude and return to the original question, my parting words would be that yes, seamanship is an essential skill and it evolves with experience and as the marine industry changes. I would say that it's not yet dying, but it's dynamic. So 
that's my final words. Thank you very much for listening to my thoughts, and I shall look forward to any questions later, and I'll pass back to John. Adam, thanks very much indeed. I'm uh, sure we'll get some questions on the uh, mindful of the, the industry's history. I'm sure we'll get some questions about the safe uh, launching and recovery of boats. It's been uh, particularly has Boy, jump in. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So uh, thank you for those insights. Um, I think one of the uh, the works that's already been referred to has been Danton Seamanship, and uh, some of us grew up with that. But another uh, key text in the industry, uh, in both the civilian and the military fields, um, is uh, the Admiralty Manual of Seamanship. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, with us uh, here today um, Vic Vance, who, who's author of that, uh, that, that fabulous <coughs> book. And he's going to tell us a little bit about... Vic, can you tell us a little bit about its development and your insights uh, around that volume? Yeah, can can do. Um, yeah, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great privilege to bring you uh, brief you as the author of the new 13th edition of the Admiralty Manual of Seamanship. After 34 years in the Royal Navy, I feel I have the knowledge and experience for the job. I served in a variety of ships from Antarctic Survey to frontline frigates, destroyers, and patrol boats with three years as the Hong Kong Patrol Squadron Seamanship Officer, as well as the Headmaster of the Locally Employed Personal Training School on Stuncutters Island. On promotion to Warrant Officer Seaman Specialist, I joined Command in Chief Fleet, jewel-hatted with Flag Officer Surface Fertility Staff, Devonport and Portsmouth, carrying out ship inspections and dealing with fleet seamanship policy. I was also an integral part in converting the old seamanship manuals Vols 1, 2, 3 and 4 into one manual until I retired from uniform service in 99. After leaving the Royal Navy and a weekend off, I took up a post at Fox Hill Bath as a desk officer for replenishment at sea and general seamanship, later being relocated to Abbey Wood, where I stayed until joining the Fleet Staff Authors Group, now, uh, now the um, uh, Warfare um, Publications Department right, in January 2004. 19 and a half years on and I've combined the Naval Seamanship Manual and the Submarine Seamanship Manual and the RFA Seamanship Manual into one consolidated publication and also carried out nine updates over that period. Researching information for manuals is not always easy, although my naval and civilian background has helped. Visiting different classes of warship and RFAs witnessing trials of new equipment on many occasions over the years and generally reacquainting myself with old and new equipment and processes has been a great help in the provision of guidance and procedures. Seamanship has developed from the experience of mariners going back hundreds of years. The debate as to whether it is an art or science will probably never be concluded, but its fascination remains undiminished no matter how we categorize it. Many changes in seamanship have taken place over the years, and I can testify to that. Indeed, so great have been some of the changes in more recent years that it is becoming painfully obvious that my generation was trained on methods that were closer to Captain Cook than the seamanship practice today. The Admiralty Manual of Seamanship is recognized throughout the world as a leading authority of seamanship and survival. It is no exaggeration to say that in the past, the high standards of seamanship in the Royal Navy have ensured military and commercial successes internationally and ensured that ships have sailed safely for hundreds of years. These same skills and standards have been emulated in navies throughout the world. Tradition is important to every navy, but this 13th edition is rooted firmly in the 21st century and caters for modern uh, conditions at sea. So writing this book wasn't a single-handed effort, partly because of its excellent pedigree, with just over 115 years of development since the first edition was published in 1908. For my part, I was supported by Navy Command Warrant Officer Seaman Specialists and RFA Chief Petty Officer Dex, who checked, validated and supplied various technical information, procedures and drills throughout the publication. Every word, graphic and photograph of the book was checked for accuracy and relevance. As already mentioned, we all know times change. Having published the 12th edition in 2004, the Nautical Institute are nine years later publishing the 13th edition that still retains the best of the old whilst adding the latest equipment and procedures of the new. 
The fundamental principles of general seamanship and seamanship evolutions have, of course, been retained. And believe it or not, some of the information in the book has changed little since the very first edition back in 1908. Time bends and hitches, splicing ropes, and the use of a block and tackle are very much the same. It's simply the materials that have changed, and in some areas, terminology. Over recent years, the introduction of high performance mooring and towing ropes and associated equipment has addressed the resource intensive seamanship evolutions carried out on board HM ships. With platforms both leg legacy and future concept ships introducing a leaner workforce, high performance mooring and towing ropes have become fundamental in the overall operation effectiveness and safety of both platform and personnel. It simply works by introducing smaller size, stronger ropes to replace all steel wire ropes and large, heavy, and often cumbersome synthetic ropes. Shipside design, designed in Type 45 destroyers and the future Type 26 and 31 frigates, reduces the ship's radar signature. And due to this new design, it has become impossible to rig and use the trusted scrambling net for the rescue of survivors and ship abandonment. The scrambling net has been replaced by a means of rescue raft. The raft is inflated on board into the shape of a large lily pad, and by using the boat's davit, it is lowered down the ship's side to the surface of the sea for survivors to clamber on, onto and be hoisted to deck level. This process will continue until all survivors are rescued and on board. In addition, this raft can also be used in an abandoned ship situation to lower ship's personnel to the surface of the sea prior to transfer to life rafts or rescue craft. Chapter five of this 13th edition has had the biggest update in the removal of rigid inflatable boats, the Avon Sea Rider and the medium inflatable boat. And of course, the insertion of the new displacement boats has been introduced in the Vahana 11 meter, used, used as a working generally, as a workboat generally, but can be converted to a survey motorboat by the embarkation of a dedicated cabin and a 15 meter version, which we also have, is used for diving, RN officer training at Dartmouth, and as a survey launch, commonly known as HMS Wildcat. As you see from this new 13th edition, 13th edition, it is published in dual media. The first six chapters are hard copy, and the complete book, including chapters seven to 11, are also available as an electronic publication and can be found on the Nautical Institute Bookshop website. This book is for professionals, a source of reference, a teaching guide, and a practical ma manual for use on board ship. And I'm delighted to have been associated with it for the whole of my naval and service careers, totaling 58 years. It will certainly stand out in any office or rigging shop. I thank Stephen Spark from the Nautical Institute for his guidance and assistance and above all is patience in ensuring that the England is right and done proper and ensuring the book is published today. I would also like to thank the graphics department for their splendid work in producing advanced graphics and animations. And sadly on my retirement next April, right, it will bring to a close of 59 years of working within the Seamship family and NATO working groups, which I have enjoyed immensely. Thank you very much. Vic, thank you very much for uh, telling us about the development and the continued relevance of the Admiralty Manual of Seamanship and some of the uh, the things that you were describing there, uh, very mm. much uh, reflecting the changing environment. So, uh, yeah, no, appreciate that, those insights and thank you uh, to you, uh, to Adam and to John as well. So uh, let's uh, let's have a look at some of the uh, the questions that are coming through and uh, just um, uh, tackle some of those. Uh, questions. Uh, there's an observation. I'm going to start with um, with, with you, um, Vic, because um, well, you're retiring in April, so we don't have any more opportunities. We'll have to to ask you questions. Um, the, what, one of the comments that came in before before the um, the webinar was um, is a seamanship skills only left to old people, or, or, or actually young people engaged in this? In, in seamanship as well. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, years ago, we you joined up as a, a gunnery rate or an RP or a TAS rate. Now you join up as a seaman. So you start at 16 years of age as a seaman specialist, work your way through to able seaman, uh, to leading seaman, to petty officer, uh, and then to chief petty officer. And, and, and after you've had a few jobs or a couple of ships doing the job of buffering, doing buoy work, boat work, anchors and cables, towing, etc., you might be lucky to become a, a warrant officer. When you become the warrant officer, that's when you will be looked at to do a job like this. Hopefully, in fact, I know that there are two warrant officer seamen ready to fill my boots when I retire. And they would have done jobs like inspections, policy, and also all the seamanship evolutions that we do. And that is within the seamanship manual. So you don't have to be that old. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And and and, and John, you, you, you mentioned, you know, the importance of um, starting small, as it were. Are you still seeing a lot of uh, interest at, with, with younger people in, in sort of boat and seamanship skills? Well, certainly small boats and starting in small boats, because if you start in a small boat, then you're engaging seamanship skills right from the very word. You've got to be able to take the little boat away, you've got to be able to bring it back again, you have got don't want to turn it over, and all of those are skills which come in as seamanship. And they then can then progress through yacht clubs and various uh, organisations of the sort to bigger boats, faster boats, sailing boats. And if you, I would suggest that if you can sail a small boat, then your seamanship skills are going to improve quite rapidly. I think uh, whether Vic could uh, agree with that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Lovely. Thank, thanks so much. We 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 have a uh, an eclectic audience out there, including um um oh, that 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 previous question, by the way, was from Parveen. I, I hope you're in the audience as well. Um, the Lewis asked a question. I don't know if that's a first name or or, or a surname. Uh, so forgive me if it's a surname. But um, uh, Adam, perhaps you'd offer your your thoughts on 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 this. Um. So Lewis uh, holds an extra master's certificate. And his question is, would you say that most seamanship is learned by informal learning um, or, or other more structured learning? Um, that's quite an interesting question. Uh, I, th I think it's a combination of both. And it probably varies what sort of ships you're on and what sort of company you're working for. but. On our vessels, we, we definitely have a combination of both. We have onboard training certificates, so um, people are trained to launch and recover each boat of a different type on board each ship, and they get an individual certificate for that. Um, so until they are certified, they're not allowed to do it unsupervised. So whenever we can, we take training opportunities to maybe launch the boat a few times in a day so that everyone can take a turn and get each element signed off um, and even just just basic exposure so if they're not on watch or not on duty perhaps they can just uh, turn to and, and and observe the operation we've got it all written in standard operating procedures so you can review it with a cup of tea in the mess room if you want to you know so there's a, there's a combination of both but certainly i think i would i would conclude it's it's fairly formal and and what, what do you see as the role of um sort of mentoring support for, for individuals as well. Is that relevant to the development of seamanship skills? Uh, Adam, that one's at you again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I um yeah, I think it is I think it is relevant. You know, this this old phrase, whether we're still allowed to say it, but this this phrase of like a sea daddy when somebody first goes to sea and they 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 held their hand and, and they're assigned somebody to uh to show them round. I think mentor mentee relationships are, are great because that gives an individual somebody that they can go to and they can ask questions perhaps informally um, they can do things in the, in their own hours um, and it gives an opportunity for that experience to be passed on but also in a sort of in a in a formal way it's 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 structured there's regular contact meetings um, and and people can pass on their knowledge and and get the most out of it in a two-way relationship no, no, no thanks for that and, and Vic, I'm going to start with you, but then I'm going to come to John with the same question. It's from Lancet. Um, in, in terms of the the actual formalised maritime education and training programmes, in your view, do they still um, sufficiently emphasise seamanship? Um, and are we are we applying these or are we preserving them to, to promote the seamanship skills? 
Well, well I think we are. Um, down at HMS Valley, they've got these training specs, uh, and they really do cover every single aspect of seamanship and what they will uh, come upon when they join their ships. We also send people to the boat training schools. They do not leave the school until they've completed their uh, craft operators course and they, they get issued a logbook and they go to their ship and then they have to go up and down the ship side away from the ship covered various times before they get the tick in the box on there. But I think we certainly do enough. Down at HMS Valley, they've got this massive RAS rig. They've got the anchors and cables facility. They've got all the boats down at Jupiter Point. And I think I think they go to their ships are quite well equipped. And all they need to do when they get on board the ship, it's just time at each subject. And plus the fact that the leading hands on board uh, will take care for them and take charge of them and teach them as they go through. So I think they are suitably uh, instructed. John, uh, any, any observations on that? Well, yeah, I mean, with the Royal Navy, yes. I mean, the Royal Navy does does the job wonderfully. Um, I'm not sure, because I haven't been to sea for a while, whether the training in, in for merchant seafarers these days is quite as good. Um, when I did my apprenticeship many years ago, we had four years learning the trade, you know, effectively as one of the seamen. And we were shown how to do things and we did them all ourselves. There does seem to be a lot more college training and they go and young cadets go off on a, a particular few months and then they go back to college. I'm afraid I'm not sure that there is sufficient practical seamanship training for merchant seafarers in the British Merchant Service. Adam, I'm sure you can perhaps update me on that and say, tell me I'm, I'm an old fart talking absolute rubbish. But um, <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I'd, I'd be inclined to to slightly agree, to be honest, John. Um, I I started at sea about 14 years ago now, and as part of that, I did a, an EDH course, obviously that was that was shore based mm. after I'd got the sea time in, and uh, uh, some of those skills I've used a lot since, and and some of them I I haven't touched, and I think it was compacted into a, a, a fairly interesting and exciting week, but uh, it was a week. And a lot of those things I, I, I've only seen in a book since, um, you know, stagings, bosun's chairs, all those things are sort of not on the way out, but they're, they're seen less and less um, commonly these days in favor of new pieces of kit. You know, we, we grease crane wires with a with a shore crane and a man riding basket these days, rather than somebody in a in a in a ropes bosun's chair. It's it's a development. It's a new skill, but nobody's nobody's sort of trained specifically in that, and that's the way things are now. But no, thank you. And and we we you, you made a, a, an interesting and useful, I think. Well, I think it was useful uh, definition of seamanship. Uh, thank you for that, jo uh, Michael. Um, uh, also offered uh, the, the the observation. It's about ensuring uh, how you, your, your vessel gets from point of departure to the point of arrival still afloat um, and in good order um, but there's someone who, who um, maybe you know him but he's got a specific question for you Andrew uh, oh, sorry it's from Andrew it's the questions for Adam um, and uh, Adam in, in your presentation you mentioned that uh, Trinity House seamanship manual is a living document uh, subject to uh, uh, continual change and improvement. Uh, the question is, how do you deliver the manual to the vessels? Is it digital or printed? Um, and, and what is the, the sort of management of change process uh, to keeping that manual up to date? Okay, yeah, well, it's um, uh, presently it's a hard copy manual, um, which is you know, paper pages that we can print out and update individually um, it is as I mentioned it's a controlled document so we uh, we have a record of amendments and, uh, and like I said everyone's encouraged to um, submit any changes or observations so the captain can do it the chief officer can do it the AB or the coxswain of the boat can do it anybody who's got some information they can bring it to the bridge and work together um, with the onboard team to get that submitted to the manual and it's been it, it was formalized about 10 or 12 years ago, I think. Before that, it was um, a lot of local knowledge clipped mm. into a little folder as a reference book. But um, I think whoever decided to put that into a manual, that was a really good decision. 
Um, and it's some things are really technical in it. You know, we've got photographs, surveys, drawings of um, Royal Sovereign Lighthouse, which some people might know, a structure off the south coast. Um, and, and that goes into great detail about how you can get one of our ships very close to it in DP. Um, and then also it's filled um, filled with hand sketches of the rocks at a particular um, lighthouse, say Wolf Rock or Bishop Rock, and how you get the motorboat right up to the, the landing. And, and, you know, OK, it, we can get perhaps some aerial photos with drones these days. They might help to supplement it. Um, but some sketches of where the rocks are are really helpful. So anybody can do it. Yes, can I just you. sort of can I just come in on that one? The um... The RM version of the Seamship Manual is also a live document, and the last edition was 2000 or December 2021. Um, this gets updated all the time. We do a, made, a major update every two years. However, during that period of time between the two years, if we get any proposed changes that need immediate effect, we then do a new version. And I just take the book, get to the page or the section that's got to be changed, change that, and then reissue that as a version two. All our proposed changes have to go from ships, rally, Abbey Wood, FOSS staffs, have to go to Navy Command, to the Warrant Officer Seaman Specialist there and his team, and they then go through the proposed changes. Nothing leaves or comes into the book unless it's gone through and agreed by Navy Command. So we keep it updated all the time. Yeah, no, th thank you. I think. Uh... Like, like uh, with so much change, it's important that we keep those uh, those changes uh, yeah. well documented. They, they all remain contemporary documents. Uh, and we're going to take a little peek around the corner of um, how technology is affecting things. We were talking um, partly about how, how do we manage to transfer these skills when crews are getting smaller, uh, voyages may be getting shorter. So how do you develop that sort of mindset of seamanship uh, amongst people? And some um, so, so, some nice remarks there uh, from from Nick that seamanship, like common sense, is both a set of skills and a mindset. Um, but how do we um, develop that uh, experience? Um, how do you what, how do you develop the mental model um, alongside the practical skills, um, John? Yeah, there you, you you flinch, so you can have the question, John. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, golly. Um, <laughs> that, that's a tough one. Um, how do you develop the mental skills? I think with an interest in the subject, um, if you have an interest in seamanship, then you'll enjoy it. And if you don't have an interest in seamanship, what are you doing at sea in the first place? Yeah. Because it is the basic tenet of really of the, everything hangs on it. Yeah. No, so it's, uh, it's, it, is, it is the mindset is is vital, I think. Say, so, but you know, why would you want to go and get cold and wet and um, have things dropped on you if you didn't enjoy it? Well, thank you. And, and Jessica made a similar point. Is that you know, does the panel believe that seamanship, past, present, and the evolving skills, but you know, being passed on to, uh, when the current trend is to reduce sea time for cadets. Um, and oh, it was a shake of the head, but I am going to come to Adam to respond to this. Um, it's Chatham House rules. Nobody will quote you, Adam. Um, so, uh, um, you know, sea time is being reduced. It's under constant pressure from a number of employers to reduce that, not, not every employer. Um, but unless you're in that environment, uh, it's it's hard to get the experience necessary um, and, um, you know, to, to gain from that experience on board. Uh, Adam, uh, are, we, are we doing it well enough? Um, well, yeah, I think uh, it, it very much depends on the types of vessels that, that cadets these days are, are accruing their sea time on. And um, at Trinity House, the, the charity side sponsor and, and give a lot of money for cadet ships and, and training. And some of them end up on our vessels and some of them don't. They go on, on ships all around the world. They go off with the British Antarctic Survey. They go on cruise ships, cargo ships, and mm -hmm. they get a real... Um, exposure to all sorts of, of elements. However, um, sometimes three months on a general cargo ship where perhaps all they do is chip and paint and never go anywhere near the bridge, they don't 
necessarily accrue the skills up on the bridge and vice versa on a cruise ship they might spend all the time on the bridge and uh, and, and not too much time down on deck so it's I think it's very hard to quantify when there's always such a range of vessels out there and such a range of companies and the way that they do things three weeks I would like to think that three or four weeks spent on a Trinity house vessel they're exposed to quite a lot uh, of basic seamanship skills because of our niche role and our and the types of ships that we have there's lots of little bits of everything um, and I think that's very beneficial but equally I wouldn't think it would be worthwhile a cadet spending 12 months on a Trinity house vessel because if they then try and navigate a large container ship across the Atlantic you know it, it goes back a long way but uh, we've still got a sextant in the drawer but none of ours have shades on it because we do horizontal sextant angles because we're <laughs> never out of sight of land yeah okay thank you for that and that, I, th I think that learning point is, is 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 also about and whether it's seamanship or indeed life skills uh it, it's about um leading by good example i think uh, and you know i think your your example there of the the conduct of the safe operations during lifting uh, a boy on board the vessel um you know there's a time critical element because of the shift in stability but there's also the clear landing area and keeping people safe and i think that's about living good practice not just talking about it uh, and i think that's a fundamental mm -hmm. fundamentally important part of the the transfer of the of the skills um what what about as as we we look towards um in, increased uh, use of technology and and we know that some of the trinity house vessels for example um and uh, and, and so on um, have got uh, equipped with dynamic positioning capabilities what what does that mean for um the application of seamanship and in, in the context maybe to start with the ship handling um and adam i'm going to start with you and then um come to you john <laughs> yeah well um again to echo what i said hopefully in, in in my first words it it becomes a new skill so you've still got to drive the ship manually in in hand and, and bringing the ship alongside we um try and get all the bridge team to to have a go at it and 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 learn that 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 key skill um one of our smaller vessels the alert that's one that i've sailed on quite a lot over the last 12 months that's in and out of port most days and it's a real good opportunity for the second officers and to to have a go at putting the ship alongside in terms of dp it becomes its own thing that you've got to apply your seamanship skills to and rubbish in rubbish out it's only as good as the information you put into it and if you try and ask the ship to sit still in position x that's beam onto the tide and beam onto the wind it's very unlikely that it'll be able to do it and the lights will go out fairly rapidly um so you you have to all those basic principles still apply where's the wind where's the tide what going to be the most comfortable position for the ship to to sit and and achieve the task so uh, and again that's that's the section in our seamanship manual that's that probably wouldn't have been there 15 years ago um and it becomes a new skill in itself yeah no no thank you uh, john anything to add to that not an awful lot because uh, um I, I came ashore long before anything like dp and all this stuff came in but I, when i saying to adam i spent a week on the patricia um as a on a as a cruise which is wonderful and i spent time on the bridge and i watched the uh, dp being used in the evolutions and i was i thought this is a wonderful tool um but i, I wouldn't have a clue how to do it myself i know because there are plenty of dp um specialists and um, in the oil and gas industry i think who is, who is a particular thing but honestly i have no experience of it at all myself in fact um I look at some of the um, ex exhibits in the museum case on the Wellington of sextants and things and think, good God, I, they're, they're museum exhibits. I use those on a daily basis. Shows how old I am. Uh, thank you. We don't. We never think of you as a museum piece, uh, John, just to sort of clear <laughs> on that. Not um, yet. <laughs> could, I, could I just jump back yep. in there, John, just to um, agree with John about, he said, the dp is a tool it is absolutely and we always have to fall back on basic skills so constantly thinking what's going to happen if it goes wrong what's going to happen if the dp is not happy and we have to come out of dp fairly rapidly what's the escape route what's the plan and and that needs to be thought about at all levels what phase are they at on the deck where is everybody are they safe and how are we going to get the ship back under control if it all goes wrong yeah no well thank you and and um Vic, you mentioned, you know, changes in design and, and, and in my closing remarks, I'm going to come back to that. Um, 
but Steve Cameron makes the point that um, uh, in, in one of the questions that you know seafarers, bridge watch keepers in particular, I think it's the point of becoming isolated from the environment by being in fully enclosed bridges and and and, and so on. What what's the impact of that from from you know the application of seamanship? But Vic, I don't know if that sits comfortably with you. But what do you think? <laughs> well, I don't think it's a great problem within the RN now because the seamen also look after the tactical. So for a short part of the time they're on the ship, they're up on the bridge doing tactical jobs. And then a month later, they'll be down on the deck doing replenishment, towing, anchor work, because the seamen now cover tactical as well. So we're sort of joined together there. And you're right, when they go up on the bridge, they can spend a bit of time up there, I suspect. Right, But then they do get a rest and they go down and they can do other jobs within the seamanship world. Yeah, yeah, thank but, you. Uh, what, one thing we do, we, I think we do have a little bit of skill fade um, because we don't have as many tankers as we used to. The ships don't need as much fuel as they used to, so we don't raz as much as we used to. So we don't raz so much now and we, we lose a little bit of that skill phase. Um, fade. And also when ships deploy, where we would have the various ships go together, we don't have that now. So we can't light jack stay with each other. We can't tow each other. And uh, I, I think as ships, and, and now of course the ship can go around the world a couple of times without needing fuel. So there's things we're not doing as much as we should do. Um, the, the, the technology is also evolving in other ways. And I, has anyone yeah. got any experience uh, on, on the panel of, of using drones? Uh, this is a question from um, a colleague in Georgia. Um, so, so thank you for that. Uh, Otari, thank you for your question. Uh, he's an associate member of the Nautical Institute. Is anyone using drones at all in the workplace? Um, well, we're not uh, we're not officially using anything um, yet. We've got a number of crew members on board who who have got a personal drone that they've flown from the ship and got some wonderful photographs. Um, and we've had lots of conversations recently about about their potential. Um, and in fact, one of the departments in the office here in Harwich is called GLA Research and Development. Development, and they're just beginning quite an in-depth um, discussion with the commander on the alert about how potentially we could survey some beacons with a drone rather than steaming the ship 100 miles there, which is of course time and its fuel and its emissions. Um, can we do that from the shore with a drone perhaps? So um, it's very much in its early um, phases, but um, certainly there's a move towards, well, well, how can we use them to supplement what we're doing, how can we use them to to reduce the risk? Because launching a boat in itself, whilst usually it's done fairly smartly and fairly safely, there's still risky elements to it. And uh, if a, a thousand pound piece of plastic and electronics is lost, well, that's not the end of the world compared to perhaps all the, the disaster that might happen if, if launching a boat goes wrong. So there's definitely potential and it's, it's being looked into. Yeah, no, well, thank you for that. And I think, um, I think Otari was particularly making the point um, uh, during mooring operations and maybe the idea is that if you've got a a um, a drone that's in a geostationary position relative to the ship with a camera you know particularly on uh, container vessels where you don't have great visibility and you're approaching the berth you could actually have a you know a live video feed showing distances and so on uh, by using that technology um, i think that's the other thing somebody was talking to me this morning uh, thank you ali um about you know ships diminishing in size but in, in many instances, we've developed uh, different mooring arrangements with with, with with ropes on drums and so on uh, in, a, in a permanent way. Uh, so that actually changes the way we go about that. And I think that's been a, a continuing theme um, of uh, people adapting to the environment uh, during your comments today. Thank you for those. I think one of the, the other questions that's going to come around uh, the corner, um, and I'm not sure how how best to address this, but uh, we talk about autonomous and remote controlled ships. Um, and, and how in that sort of environment, um, and, um, uh, and and I think it might have been Ian who, who made this point, um, uh, how, how, how do we transfer that sort of seamanship intel to people who are not in the environment? And how do we do that in, in a remote context? Um, and, and any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> 
All I accept autonomous ships are a splendid, I think, probably a splendid idea for those who know how to operate them. But surely there are some facets where you have to have the men on board to do certain things. It can't all be done from an office. You can't send away ropes off the forecastle head down to the jetty if you're sitting in an office 10,000 miles away. Yeah. Or am I, being, so, am I being innocent abroad here? I, I, I don't think so. One of the uh, pieces of work that the Nautical Institute did a couple of years ago was to define the experience and, and, and so on that uh, remote control center operators should have <clears throat> for uh, dynamic positioning operators. Um, and, and a fundamental um, construct of that was actually experience on board the ship um, so that you know you can go to that environment and understand what you're talking about when you're looking at data whereas if someone's only come from a technical background then, then they're, they're lacking that perspective uh, so I think there's a lot of work to do to ensure that we're supported by technology uh, and not driven by it and I just want to come back to um, I, I'm going to quote it as good practice. Maybe it's best practice. Uh, Adam, you, you spoke about the um, the launching and recovery of boats. We constantly see uh, in, in the Merchant Navy uh, accidents, serious injuries, fatal accidents uh, with the launch and recovery of survival craft. Um, Trinity House is doing it all the time. Tell us again about the experience that your organization has put in place to uh, to keep keep the seafarers safe. <laughs> Well, as, as I mentioned earlier on, um, we have onboard training certificates for those who are operating, launching, recovering the boats. And of course, um, Patricia's still got lifeboats. Galatea has a rescue boat, as does Alert. So there's um, statutory elements that have to be fulfilled there with the regular drills that have to be performed. And again, perhaps we're in quite a fortunate position because um, our schedule is fairly flexible. We go where we need to go when we need to go there. And therefore, we try to take as much opportunity as possible to get the most out of these drills and these training evolutions. So mm -hmm. rather than um, particularly on, on alert, as an example, rather than just launch the rescue boat uh, once with the two dedicated crew members, well, there's only six people on that vessel, and if those two or one of those two has fallen over the side, it may well be the chief engineer who has to help uh, operate the davit. So we take it in turns to all rotate through the roles um, so that everyone's got a little bit of exposure and they know what to do um, should they be required to do it. And I think mentioning, referencing a chief engineer there, particularly on small vessels, um, seamanship is essential from the from the top to the bottom and from port to starboard, however you want to phrase it, everybody needs to know a little bit because who knows what's going to be uh, required, you know? Well, thank you very much indeed. And certainly, Michael, in the in the uh, the, um, the questions made the point that taking time to do some of those essential exercises really adds value to the learning and the seamanship. Um, but it is time for us to start to draw to a close. Can I thank all of uh, our panel members to, uh, for the time they've taken in, in addressing those questions? My thanks to the uh, um, the, all, the global audience for for for, for putting those questions uh, to us. Um, and, and giving them uh, straight from in, in a live environment, as it were. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Vic, for all the work that you've done in, in terms of authoring the uh, the Admiralty Manual of Seamanship. We're, we're really pleased to be the uh, the publisher of choice uh, for the Royal Navy. Um, the the Navy uh, the Royal Navy is regarded as uh, a world leader in seamanship, and so we're proud that as part of today's proceedings that we're, we're formally launching the latest edition of this major uh, publication that's been comprehensively updated as it is every couple years in the way uh, described by, by Vic, so thank you for that. Uh, and as a special offer for being here today, um, we, we are um, um, offering a promotional code. It's only there for a week, so uh, if you, if you uh, would like to, uh, to take advantage of that, tell your mates it's not too early for Christmas. Um, so uh, that, that's the, the opportunity that ar uh, arises there. Uh, my thanks to the, uh, the backroom team uh, at the Nautical Institute for putting on this uh, webinar. Um, and I'm just going to invite um, David, uh, David to come back to, uh, uh, to say a few words. Uh, David, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, and thank you to all, all the panelists and thank you to all the people attending. Um, I would like to just remind everybody that we are a membership organization um, and we have branches all over the world who hold events, uh, physical events and uh, virtual events. So please uh, check them out. 
And uh, again, if you have not signed up to be a member yet, please do. So thank you very much for attending this webinar, and I will say goodbye from London. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>